at Subway. Start your day the flavorful way by adding new guacamole to your favorite breakfast sandwich. Perfectly made with a hint of jalapeno, our guacamole turns up the flavor to your breakfast. Try it today on a hot and toasty egg white and cheese. Subway, eat fresh. The BS Report is a free-flowing conversation that occasionally touches on mature subjects. The BS Report. The BS Report with Bill Simmons. Welcome to the BS Report. Taping this on a Thursday morning, Southern California time. Sunny, 85 degrees. Nice, happy. Uh, not as happy the Donald Sterling story. We've been writing about it all week on Grantland. We've had some uh, variety of pieces. I wrote one today, actually, that went up. Um, check that out on Grantland. Check out Wesley and Rem. Check out Chris and Andrew Sharp. We had a bunch of them. The one person is not went in from the Grantland universe, Chuck Klosterman. How are you? Good. How are you doing, William? I'm good. I, 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 it is weird that this story has totally overshadowed. Well, I guess it's not weird, but it's it's. I think it's interesting that it's totally overshadowed. Okay, in any other playoffs, like what's going on with Oklahoma City, I feel like would have been one of the biggest NBA stories of the last 10 years, right? Am I overreacting to that? Well, I, I don't think so. I mean, in the sense that there was a time a few days ago, I don't know, necessarily think this now, where I was thinking, well, boy, all top four seeds in the West are all going to lose. Um, I don't mm. know if I've ever watched a series where the teams were as evenly matched as Houston and Portland to the point where I'm not even sure – that the outcomes of the games are telling us who's better. However, it's very easy to understand why this was sort of became secondary. I mean, this is yes. sort of a transformative moment in sports. I don't know if I can think of another time in my life where there was such a, like a kind of a clear, transparent message that suggested that the league really is owned by the players and not by the owners. Mm. I mean, I think this is the closest we've ever come to uh, to any kind of authoritative decision suggesting that. Uh, you know, it's interesting in the Sterling tape at one point, he's even saying to his, you know, among the many strange things about like, uh, you know, it's like, is it not the 30 owners who run this league and, and pay, pay for all these things, you know? And I feel like this has been the, the pre-existing belief, but this event sort of suggests otherwise, that for the first time it really looks like the commissioner felt an obligation to uh, sort of uh, totally side with the players. Yeah, I, I do wonder, like, all right, let's say Sterling, let's say he calls Sterling on Monday. He's like, look, we got to talk. Like, I'm thinking about banning you for life. I just need to know, like, the, what you said on the tape, tell me what you were thinking, tell me how you feel now. And if Sterling had had done been like, look, I I was taking over the counter medication, like but I was drinking, like blah blah blah. And I obviously I'm horrified. What can I do? And shown like the right level of remorse. I think maybe the suspension would have been indefinite instead of lifetime. But I think Sterling, he was Silver even said, like he's like he did. He, I the reporter asked him, and Silver said something like. He did not express any views that directly were different than what he said in those tapes. And I think that's what finished him off because clearly well, he, Sterling was like, I'm not apologizing for that. I, I think it's more than just the lack of the apology. I'm actually uh, I'm working on I got a bunch of questions uh, for the ethicist this week. A lot of them mm. involving uh, Donald Sterling and I'm answering one right now. And it uh <laughs> It sort of comes down to like this, the, like the problem is, or the or the the question being posed is, is did this happen because of what he said, or did this happen because of what he believes? In other words, like is the idea that you can lose your franchise because you have a certain belief system? Is that sort of you know is that how we're supposed to view uh, NBA ownership now? And I think it's really a, a, a collision of those two things. I mean, there had been this kind of this pre-existing perception that uh, of what Donald Sterling was like, but it was still just perception. It was still kind of this fungible thing that no matter what the evidence was, you could always say like, well, you know, uh, this is uh, subject to his denial or whatever. And then the tape totally validated that perception in a way that yes. kind of made them irretractable. So I, you know, I, I don't know if a, uh, in his case, an apology would have helped, you know? I think it only would have helped the difference between a lifetime ban versus indefinite. I still think Silver probably would have leaned toward the lifetime ban because there's people 
just wanted justice and I, and you know it became an important moment for Silver just to establish his commissionership to just say I'm taking care of business I'm not leaving any loopholes here we're getting rid of this guy but you mentioned that question that you got for the ethicist I think the third element to this which people keep underrating is is the three decades of behavior and it was like they never had the smoking gun with this guy but there were just so many different smaller stories and anecdotes and embarrassing moments and you know, he just wasn't somebody they wanted to represent the league as one of the 30 owners, but they couldn't really do anything about it because he never did the one thing that would allow them to kind of proceed with trying to get rid of the team, rid of the ownership. And also they knew how litigious he was. Mm -hmm. So it was almost like I, it's really seems like Stern was afraid of him. You know what I found out today? Donald Sterling's best friend was Al Davis. Did you know that? I did not know that. But, I mean, it kind know, of that, it kind of makes more sense when you think about it. If you just think about it, like the NBA did not want to create their own Al Davis and mm -hmm. just spend years and years and years in in courtrooms fighting this guy, and we're just like, ah, screw it. That team sucks anyway. You know what I mean? Well, I I definitely feel like the day after the press conference, Silver must have went home and thought, boy, I played this right. People right. were pretty jacked about it when it happened. It was like, yeah. I, you don't often see that kind of sort of universal support for a decision by the commissioner. Um, but, you know, this th this was this was such a, a unique kind of issue where there didn't seem to be uh, an other side. Like there didn't seem there, there was when you'd watch like all like the kind of the talking head shows, the guys who were like really like to bloviate about these things. They really had free reign. Because there was nobody sort of going like, well, we have to kind of contextualize what he said or, you know, like no one did that. So it was just it was like a real uh, interesting avalanche of support for his. Yeah, the only the only uh, the only counter because people love doing the counters, especially in the Internet era when they're trying to see how many days in a row they can get out of a story. There's the, there is that the, the slippery slope narrative that Cuban mentioned a couple of times has become. It seems like if this story is going to keep going and going, people are going to be talking about that. And people are pointing to the Orlando Magic owner. Well, he's against gay marriage. What if he says something offensive about that? Do we take, do we get rid of his franchise? And I do think that's going to be a narrative. I think the difference with this was the, the three decades of behavior and then just, just the, the actual audio of those tapes. And, um, I, I just thought it was racism as, as, as pure as you're going to find it, you know, just this entitled white guy who wanted to keep things that way and keep minorities in a certain place. Like you're never going to get racism personified better than it is in those tapes. Well, and it's just, he's such a strange character. And I think so many of the, in, the bizarre contradictions on the audio, the fact that he's talking to a woman of like a biracial woman about these things alone, but you know, yeah. Uh, you can, you can go back and read like all these things from his life. Like, you know, there's the famous sort of anecdote where like he tells Elgin Baylor that he would, that like his dream team would be uh, like an all black team, uh, you know, coached by a Southern white guy. So it would have this kind of plantation feel beyond being incredibly racist. Isn't that weird? Yeah, he's sort of like, I would love, you know, what would I want my team to be? You know what? A metaphor for 18th century Georgia. Like that, <laughs> that's what I envision this NBA team representing. It's like, it's a strange thing that to come up with. I don't, you know? Yeah. He's, he's a crazy person. And the, the, the stuff that the one thing, cause I, I waited pretty late to write my column. And the one thing that I felt like hadn't really been tapped into enough was just what it was like to work with this guy day in and day out. And, you hear these stories about, you know, in the late 80s, early 90s, the season, the Clipper season would end in, what, early April. And Sterling would then immediately start firing the sales staff, the PR people, basically everybody, so he didn't have to pay them from April to September. And then in September, he would rehire those positions. And he thought, like, he was a genius for pulling this off. Like, he did, he just had no fundamental understanding whatsoever of what it's like to work in an environment like that. When the see when your boss cares about you so little that he's just going to fire you right at the end of the season, then rehire you in October. And if you don't have a better job, you have to just suck it up and go back to that job, knowing that you work for the ultimate scumbag. Like mm -hmm. that's the stuff that really wasn't coming out. I don't think people realized just what a horrendous boss he was. You know, I think everyone was so focused on the racist part and rightly so, but this was also the worst sports owner 
probably in any sport for, you know, for real legitimate reasons that everybody knew about. What, what did you think about? It seemed like they, they're part of the narrative was like, well, we knew this guy was like this. And where was the media back then? Cause I've been getting a few of those emails. I feel like, I, I don't know. I, I used to mention in columns that he was, you know, seemed like he was a racist and he was cheap. Do you feel like the media failed in some way, not pushing this enough? Well, you know, I mean, there was certainly a perception that he was racist, but we don't make uh, decisions based on perception in this way. I mean, you know, yes, he was sued twice for, you know, discriminatory housing practices as a landlord. Well, uh, personally, I don't know if a pro sports league should uh, – start making decisions about how the league operates based on these people's lives and as businessmen outside of this corrupt that they may be. I mean, that yep. if, if people are saying that 10 years ago uh, he should have had his ownership taken away, I, I think, I don't know if what, what the grounds would have been at the time besides we just don't like this person and we need it to. It would have been impossible. Him. Yeah. I, I, you just can't do it. I, I, I don't think there was any, you know, they were just waiting and waiting for the one thing that they could get him on and they just didn't have it, you know? And I also wouldn't, I do think there was something to it. It's like, it's not the worst thing if you're an NBA owner to have this terrible franchise in your league that, you know, routinely gets these lottery picks and then screws them up and then you're able to go get them in the open market. And this is a team, you know, you can beat. you know, it's almost like keeping the bad team in your fantasy league. That's you're in a 10 team fantasy league. And it's like, ah, oh, there's that one guy who doesn't pay attention. Well, Let's yeah, keep but, him in. I mean, nobody thought that they should have, the NBA should have gotten involved because he was bad at being an owner. Do they? Well, he, but he was some of the stuff he did, I think was really on the line, but unfortunately not over the line. And the other problem is he was smart in this respect. Like he settled a lot of those housing discrimination things before they ever became like a full blown, trial you know he's just paying mm -hmm. the people off early so then and then you can know when you do that you can always hide behind the oh well I, I was innocent it's just i didn't want you know i didn't want to go through a trial and all that so it's just easier to get rid of that well and then yeah how do you know? and, I, it, 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 and there is i mean a part of this you know is just the the existence of a tape that anyone can hear that suddenly gets people who have no interest in NBA ownership involved. Uh, it, it's, th this is somewhat technology based too, I think. What did you think of, uh, I thought Kareem's statements were very interesting. I think that Kareem has, Kareem has reinvented himself as one of the most interesting post-career athletes I think we've ever had. Like he's written some really smart, Interesting, provocative stuff, I feel like. I mean, right? the, the illegality of this tape, it is a, it's an interesting X factor. I was, mm. you know, if, cause if this was brought up six months ago as a hypothetical, if you said to someone like, um, Hey, what do you think should happen if, uh, uh if a owner of a pro franchise pro sports franchise is uh, illegally and secretly taped by his girlfriend saying offensive things. Do you yeah. think they, she should be forced out of the league? Everybody would be like, of course not. But then when we get this real world situation and because it's this guy who has this specific history, it seemed almost obvious that this what you know, this is what should be done, you know? Although it didn't seem obvious, I guess, until Silver did it. I think an hour before that press conference, the 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 consensus was that nothing was really going to happen. Yeah, I didn't. I mean, I, I was trying to, I tweeted probably an hour before about that. He was doing the nuclear bomb because it's, it started to trickle out right before. I think he had to, I, I think if only to, because it was the right thing, but also to establish his position going forward as a commissioner who responds to how angry his players were and how angry America was like when the president gets involved, that it, it's a whole other animal, but, you know, the part that it's hard to imagine anything in this story because it's the biggest sports story of 2014, hands down. It's hard to imagine anything in here didn't get enough attention, but I'm not sure it got enough attention that all six teams on Tuesday night were not going to play. Well, yeah, I started hearing about that last night. Um, and that's a uh, real thing. That's 100% true. It was in the works. They were not going to play if they were unhappy with the verdict. 
Well, okay. At what point was that known to Silver? I think he was became very aware of that on Monday. And it wasn't just that. It was like, not only are we doing this, but as soon as the playoffs are over, all the Clippers are filing lawsuits demanding their free agency because of the work environment that they work for. They want off the team. So now you have to deal with that too. You're going to have, um, you're going to have, um, a whole free agency lawsuit that will be this watershed lawsuit that could actually threaten, um, the entire fabric of free, free agency in the draft if the players establish some new precedent. Well, although that what isn't will be, in there. What will be their argument as to why that should happen? That the work environment they're in is unsafe because of yeah, the ownership of the unsafe, th- racist, um, uh, mentally, mentally, whatever. I mean, there's they have forty outs with that, right? Um, and and what would have happened is, and then you also have the players union, you have all the agents, um, you have the uh, the potential of other players boycotting, like. This is something that could have derailed the league. And that's why you look at like the Artest Melee and you look at Donahue and you look at Kermit Washington's punch of Rudy Tomjanovich. And it's like, these were all things that were bad for the league that really affected how fans felt about it. But ultimately the league was going to go on with all three of those things. This was different. Mm. This was something that could actually have affected next season, could have affected how player movement happens, like everything. And on top of that, you have a league that's, you know, 75% black and you have a, a, one of the 30 owners is, is just as racist as it can get, you know, and, and you also have mostly white people running the league except for Mark Tatum, you know, yeah, um, that, that, that's, that's another that's issue. Yeah. It is. It is. I mean, it, it really exacerbates the problem. I mean, you know, we got to, you have this, this guy who doesn't want black people seemingly coming to his games, and yet he has a black coach and 10 of his 12 guys he's employing are black. It just, it seems so, like, aggressively contradictory. And, and, and a minority girlfriend. Yeah, yeah I, I know. It's just, it's, it, it's crazy. He a, he's a crazy person. The, 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 the bottom line is he was a crazy old person. It is. And, I'm amazed that we haven't heard from him this week. Hey, from, you know, I've been in LA for since 2002. And I just, from everything, all the information and all the stories I've ever heard about Sterling and all my interactions with all the people who work for the Clippers and everything, like, led me to believe that Sterling was going to act like a crazy person this week once they tried to take away his team. I thought he was going to be stubborn. You can't take away my team. I'll fight to the death for them. I really thought that's how this was going to play out. And he hasn't said anything. Well, I think I, I there, mean, we haven't there's, heard only, there's only one possible response he could give. We and were rehearsing that? a play. My girlfriend and I had written this play about the problem of racism and we were rehearsing it and it got taped. Oh, that's, that's the only thing you could say. <laughs> that's interesting. Hey, as the ethicist, um, Two two part question. How did you feel about how the Clippers handled game four in Golden State? And how did you feel about um their plan how they handled the next uh seventy two hours? Well, the first thing that they did, uh I thought was pretty measured, pretty reasonable. It just seemed weird if they wouldn't have recognized it at all, you know, and just and tried to block it out. That would have seemed uh extremely uncomfortable. So I, I thought that was pretty good. I thought that, 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 you know, it was, um, uh, I mean, it wasn't a, uh, cause I mean, it's, to a degree, I mean, like, it's not, it's not that they're strictly playing for this man, Like they're playing for in theory, each other, for the community, for themselves, for all of these things. So I, 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 I would have been, um, I wouldn't have been, upset if they would have chose not to play, but I would have been surprised if they did. And this yeah, you know sort what? Of- the, part of the problem, I think, was everything was so fresh and new and unbelievable. And they basically had, you know, 28 hours to, to kind of digest it, um, get mad about it, talk to people about it. They had, and this is why I knew they were going to lose game four. I just knew it because you think about what their Saturday was like. Every single person in their life is emailing them, texting them, calling them. What are you guys going to do? What's up with your owner? You know, and that's what they were dealing with all day Saturday. And then all day Sunday morning, it turns into, well, what should we do? And what I thought was interesting 
I hope I don't betray Jalen here. I don't think I'm going to. We went on halftime, and Jalen talked about how he didn't think it was enough for the Clippers to just let Doc Rivers speak for them because that was the plan. And he said, you know, I do think they have to do something. You think of, he talked about some of his heroes growing up and different people stood up in some way, and he felt like the players had some sort of obligation to do something. So only a couple minutes after that, one of his, one of the people that he's, you know, close with on the team texted him and said, a bunch of us watched you guys at halftime. We're going to do something. And that's what led to the warm up thing, what Jalen said at halftime. So my, my takeaway on that was it's interesting that it took Jalen for them to really feel like they had to do something. I think that tells you like how overwhelming the story was. Like it was like they were literally trapped. It was like an avalanche and they couldn't even see clearly for a second. Because I don't think it would have been right for just Doc Rivers to speak for them. I didn't agree with that. I mean, it would really, I guess, depend on what he said, you know. Uh, but I, I do think it. I mean, I, in retrospect, it was a good move. I think it was, uh, you know, it was interesting how then the story came out that that when the game moved to L.A., if uh, Sterling had not, if had had Silver not kind of made this kind of aggressive move, that Golden State yeah. was going to walk off, and they were going to hope that the Clippers would join them. Um, kind of a practical question: what What happens yeah. if that occurs? Is it a forfeit against the first team to walk off? Is the game just you, nullified? You, you could argue that they should have postponed that game for two days to so everybody could figure out what to do. But, you know, from a TV standpoint, it's so tough to do that. And I think that that's what made Silver have to push his decision ahead to do it at 2 o'clock Eastern before that game because he wanted to make sure all three of those games were played. But I went to that game, and – you know, it's game fives are always my favorite game of the series in a lot of ways because I just feel like the teams have figured the, each other out at that point. There's a level of intensity, and they start not liking each other, and it's usually an awesome game. And the crowd was awesome. The game itself was not that awesome. The players, I thought the Clippers looked worn out mentally to me. The the Warriors, you know, it just didn't – it lacked a competitive – edge that I felt like that game normally would have had. And, and it just never totally felt right. It was entertaining. But um, when you compare it to like some of these other series, like, you know, Tony Allen just trying to kill Oklahoma City, the way Russell Westbrook, you know, him stripping Conley with five seconds left. And that, that, there's a competitiveness in those games that I didn't totally see in game five. So you could argue Maybe they should have waited. I don't know. Well, I but you know, I, I that was a situation where uh, both teams sort of uh, had sort of the strange common ground of supporting each other yes. and feeling like they were together on things, and and uh, I, I maybe that did take a little bit of the competitive edge off. Uh, I mean, yeah, they were athletes, equally affected. Yeah. You know what's uh, weird? Going to a game that had no advertising. It was kind of like. I, I went to, uh, I saw Pearl Jam at the new LA Forum, which has been redone, which at some point in the next six months, you're going to have to go see a show there because it has no luxury suites whatsoever. It's out of 1965, but it's state, it's the state of the art circle arena of just seats. And it's really cool and it's different. And it doesn't have like all the luxury suites crammed in and all the, all the bells and whistles the new places have. And that, that's a little bit what that game five reminded me of. It was this throwback game to just, you know, just guys playing basketball, basically. Hmm. And a jumbotron, I guess. But, uh, all right. So, um, the, the six teams boycotting game, the, the game fives basically on Tuesday night had that happen. Um, how did, how would you have felt if that happened? <laughs> Okay, so we're assuming that uh, that Silver comes out and he says, like, well, the investigation is still pending. Um, we're, we're not going. I'm not. I'm not going to rush to judgment or whatever. And then, so nothing has happened. And then, and then as a response, yeah, so Silver saying, comes out and he says, let's say Silver comes out and he says, I'm suspending so, uh, Sterling indefinitely for the playoffs. Um, I'm going to proceed with the, with deciding when he should be able to return, if ever. And whether um, we should proceed with steps to make him sell the Clippers, but it's too early, blah blah blah, and basically just did a wishy-washy version of what he did. Well, that would have been a real interesting scenario. I think that the owners 
would have basically, I think the, in some ways the result would have been the same, that the other 29 owners would have felt like, look, we've, we've got to intercede here. This is going to wreck this league in a way that, uh, that perhaps we did not see coming, you know, uh, yeah. it would, you know, and then, um, I mean, and would there, you know, would anyone have crossed the picket line? I don't know. We would, we would some guys nah, have showed up to play? I mean, you know, whenever <laughs> like just start, Marcin Gortat, <laughs> yeah. well, he's well, like, I'm you here. Know, when we, you know, when the NFL strikes, that sometimes happens that yeah. these guys cross the picket. I mean, this would be, this would be a different kind of strike. It would be a, uh, it would be a real, uh, problematic move to be, to cross the picket line in the snare. But I don't, I don't know. What do you think would happen if that would have occurred? I think they would have boycotted. And I, I think anything he did that wasn't hard enough would have been uh would have been received the wrong way. And I think the players you know, it's interesting, the players are in a crazy spot because they they haven't really had a players union now for two years. Billy Hunter, after negotiating that lockout, even as it was happening, was checking out. They could never get a hold of him. Nobody ever knew what was going on with that lockout and they ended up getting a terrible deal. Then all some stuff, all this stuff happens afterwards with, with, it comes out. He's got four family members on the, in the payroll and they end up, they force him out, but they never replaced him. This is, they have a union with nobody running it except for, I think the guy's name is Ron Kleppner, who's basically a lawyer, but he's not a figurehead. And it was interesting to see Kevin Johnson, who's not even really involved, just more as a former player and somebody who cares. And, you know, I'm sure there was a little part of it that it was great for him just career wise. Cause he's somebody that wants to do bigger and better things, but he comes in and it really seems like he helped write the ship. Like he, he, uh, he gave the players a voice. He gave them somebody to kind of fight their battles. Silver respects him. And I, th- I thought he was one of the big winners with the whole thing, but I, well, I think he would have mobilized the players to not play that day. This was one scenario where a union was not necessary. It really happened organically. I mean, I yeah. it's it, I seem it feels dumb to always, you know, as like a white person to express surprise over these things. But like when I was watching uh, the TNT show the night of the press conference, at one point I was like, I think Kenny Smith is going to start crying. Like I, I like you know, and like they, and you could yeah. see how Barkley and Smith were so um, uh, relieved and how good that they felt, and then you were seeing these, you know, like Scotty Pippen is tweeting about it. These guys who've been out of the league for a while, they, they, I think maybe part of this might have to do with that many of these people like still have like one to one memories of what a jerk Sterling was in their own experience, maybe even outside yep. of racism, just like his, 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 his kind of his unwillingness to spend money and all of these things. But I just, it, it seemed as though that the, the, the natural response by players was, uh, Kind of unlike anything. I, I, I'm trying to think of other scenarios where it seemed like all the players seem to universally feel the same way about something instantly. You know, I, yeah, I don't know what that would be. Yeah, you know, and this is something that, as I was working on my book way back when, really struck me that I think the NBA, out of all the leagues, has has done the best job over the years at responding collectively, and also like. It's been just the best kind of vessel to whatever is going on in America with race and all this other stuff, right? Like you think about like the 60s, the NBA was the most interesting league in the 60s with the battles they were fighting and trying to sell a black league to a white audience and some of the proud guys they had in the league back then. Um, and then that kind of transfers to the 70s and the league becomes quote unquote too black. And oh, they, they're tape delaying finals games. And then all of a sudden everything flips because Magic Johnson shows up and then Jordan. And now it's by far the most marketable league just for personalities. I mean, it's like, I would say out of the most popular American athletes, would you say 85% of them are basketball players? I, you know, it might be because I would say at this point, pro basketball almost seems like a bigger deal socially than it does as a sport. I mean, it still yeah. seems like it's about the fifth most popular sport in this country. And in terms of these kind of conversations about things that sort of, I guess, you know, they always use the word transcend, things that like yeah. transcends the game. This happened, you know, it, it, it's really now central because of the fact that it is like this one very visible league 
where the polarity of race in America is just perfectly flipped. In that, yeah. that, you know, that, that, that I mean, the, the percentages don't work out perfectly, but they come very close to being almost a reverse of how America normally operates. And, uh, you know, I, I, and it also, I, hold on, one more thing off that note, it also yeah. taps into another element, which is like these rich, powerful people who buy these teams and in basketball or everything else, it's kind of a little bit what I wrote a couple weeks ago. You feel like you you know the owner of each team in basketball, right? Like these guys sit courtside. You see them. I, you can see the some of the football guys in the luxury box, but it's not the same. In this one, these guys are – it's their courtside, and it's their team, and it's like it's like they own a yacht or something, you know? And uh, and I think that's interesting too, and I, and I really do think like when this when the Clippers become go for sale, um, you're going to have so many people that want in. I don't think people have any idea what this auction is going to be like. Because it's an L.A. team, it's a good team, you're buying a contender, um, and you're following Sterling, the worst owner in the history of the league. Like, just by comparison, you've won. You're, 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 you're now dating the girl who just had the worst boyfriend of all time. Like, anything you do, you're going to be a better boyfriend. And I think a lot of people are sniffing this out. I think it's going to go for a huge, huge, huge price. But anyway, go oh, ahead. I mean, it's, it's really raised the profile of the franchise in a weird way. Yes. I mean, you know, totally. I think you're, uh, you know, there are people who, who, you know, don't follow sports at all, could maybe name four NBA franchises or five NBA franchises, and now they can name a sixth. Um, yes. I, uh, I texted you this uh, before the press conference. I'm wondering if your response to my question is any different now after uh, what has happened. Which of these statements do you feel is more true, mm. that the commissioner works for the owners – Yes. Or that the owners essentially cede authority to the commissioner once they give him the job. Um, it's a great question. I think the commissioner works for the owners, but I think what's interesting about what happened here in basketball is the commissioner exerted more authority than I think we've seen in a while with commissioners. I feel like Goodell wouldn't burp without asking like Jerry Jones and Bob Kraft at this point. Right. I just feel like he's in their pocket so completely and totally. It's, it's just okay. it's shameless. That's interesting because I perceive Selig as more an extension of the owners, almost a puppet of the owners. Oh, I well, feel he like is an did, owner. I, of course. He, yeah. Of course. He was an owner and he, that's yes. why they love having him. Yes. He's one of the owners. Yes. And in the NFL, it's interesting to me because I feel that Goodell has, um, that, that they do seem to cede a great deal of power to him. He seems like the most powerful owner to me, um, although I'm not not in totality. But now – I don't agree. I think he's a lackey. You think, well, okay. that's. I mean, it might be. I'm, I'm not I, – I, But you. so you think that, um, that he has – Goodell has less control over the owners than Tagliabue did? I think Goodell makes every single decision based on – how it's going to help his owners. And I don't think he gives a crap about the players. The fact that they're even discussing an 18 game season. Um, that's evidence. A, um, <laughs> the fact that they tried to bury concussions for that long and pretend they weren't an issue. The fact that they look the other way with PEDs. I mean, come on. They don't care about the players. The players are like meat. to Well, those guys. I know I, I, the players, I guess I wasn't even putting into this equation. Because well, but, I mean, I just think, you know, but that's like, the whole point, though. He cares about the owners. Eight, going to an 18 game schedule. Yes, it's, it's to the benefit of the owners. In a way, it is to the benefit of the league, despite the fact that it's going to be a detriment to their employees. Like, like if there's, if they went to an 18 game schedule, which I don't think is going to happen, you, me, everybody would say they shouldn't be doing this. This is bad. It's watering down the product. You know, we don't want to see football like the way Cuban was. Like, I don't want to see football on Friday and all these things. And yet, we all know that if the NFL was on Friday night, in a way that would be great, I would love to know that if I'm home on Friday night that there was an NFL game on, that would be good. It would be good for the league as a whole. Um, so I don't know if Goodell is – I mean, what Goodell does when he helps the league, obviously, because of revenue sharing, helps the owners. But I think that – because the NFL is worth so much, uh, they see the ability of him to make decisions that expand that empire. You know what I'm saying? I, or do you just do you I disagree? Think, I think Jerry Jones and Bob Kraft and some of the other powerful owners run that week. 
I do. Like, even if you're going to consider an 18 game schedule, which any rational person thinks is ridiculous, then at least say, Hey, if we're doing this, you know, just so you guys know, we're also going to put in a rule. No player can play more than 15 regular season games. So that's just going to be in there. Every, every player play sits out for three of those 18 games. It'll be up to the team to decide who they are. Quarterbacks, punters, kickers. You only get to play 15 of those 18. Then I can see it. Yeah, and, I, would, and by the way, that would be really interesting because it would be like, oh, do we do we use one of our Tom Brady rest days on a day when you know this guy isn't? Like, and by the way, ridiculous. Just keep 16 so we don't have to do that. But if you're going to do it, then you at least have I mean, to cut down the number of games. That, it would be interesting, I guess. I don't. I, the, it seems kind of goofy to me. Well, let me let me rephrase my original question then. Okay, so if your answer is that you're saying ultimately. Uh, the commissioner works for the owners. Should that be how it is? I mean, obviously, the owners are you know com- uh, uh, basically allow these leagues to exist in a way. There is not a league without the owners. So, yeah. should the commissioner essentially be an extension of their desires, or would the would would it be better if the system that is that the owners somehow agree that the commissioner has power, like almost unlimited power over them? All right, so this is interesting. Notice how you left out fans completely, um, okay, which yeah. is what people do with commissioners, right? So ideally the owner would have – his interest would be I'm representing the owners and I'm looking out for these guys because there are 30 investors in this league that we've created and we're protecting. But I also care about the players and their welfare and making sure that we get the best out of them, that they're happy in their work environment, all that stuff. The part that everybody forgets, and this is the part that, uh, you know, that really marred the last 10 years for David Stern, um, the fans and the fact that like, I hate to keep harping on Oklahoma City and Seattle, but to, to move that team out of Seattle for reasons that weren't really that good. And then to not, and they have these two guys trying to buy another team and everybody collectively decides, well, you know what? We'll just keep these guys in our back pocket because all they're doing is driving up the price for every other team for a hundred million. You know, they got a hundred million more for the bucks than they would have if Seattle didn't exist. Same thing for what was the last team that sold before uh, Milwaukee? Um, I'm blanking. Oh, Sacramento. Yes. Sacramento. So the Sacramento goes for five twenty five or five thirty three just because these Seattle guys wanted to steal them. So now you have this whole fan base that was disenfranchised. You pulled their team away into Oklahoma City. Oklahoma City now is this team. They won't ever go over the luxury tax. You know, they, they make, they've basically built this team around three guys and they're trying to hope it's enough. And that's a whole other story. But, um, it's just interesting to me that the fans kind of get but, rolled over. But in a situation how, like that. how do you quantify the position of the fans as your as a commissioner? Okay, you say it's awful that Seattle lost this franchise. It's awful for the Seattle fan base. Well, I suppose it's good for people living in Oklahoma. Their their life right. has has you know. Also, if we you know, let's use the NFL as another example. How do you factor in the problem with concussions and the desire of the fan? The fan who may sort of unconsciously enjoy a violent game should that should that be factored into these decision makings? I don't know how you can possibly the, when you look at when you talk about fans. How many yeah. fans are there of a given sports league? How many fans of the NBA are there? I have no idea what the number is, but I know it's a large enough number that we're not going to have any kind of consensus about what's good for the league. Yeah, it's a fair point. I mean. Ideally, you would think the commissioner would factor those three groups at all times in every decision. I think that's what was so interesting about what Adam did on Tuesday. What, you know, he handled it so well in the press conference. I, I was really impressed, but he also managed to satisfy all three group, all three groups in a way that a leader would satisfy, you know, in the right kind of way for a leader to satisfy all three groups. It was one of those rare situations. It actually made me think like, um, like Stern, in, in some way, Stern had to be like, damn, why didn't I retire in June? Like, wouldn't Stern have loved this whole situation more than any human being ever? I, I mean, he's got to just be kicking himself. 
I, I wonder what he would have done. Would he have done exactly what Silver did or something totally different? I, I it, It's kind of fun to speculate. On what would he have been totally have irrational? Would he have... Would he have taken it personally that the players were boycotting? Because Stern always kind of had that old guy mentality yes. about the players, right? Hey, just remember, you work for us. You're going to dress the way I want you to dress. You're going to take less contracts because – I mean less years in your contract because well, it's know, good and, for and us. The, and, the, and the hilarious irony of this is that with one press conference – Silver is now perceived as a more hardline guy than Stern. For all the things Stern did try to do to get those guys to wear ties and and like right. you know do all cover their tattoos and all this, it, 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 it's it's completely been just eradicated by like this one kind of strong, reasonable, uh, rational point, which is that he pretty much said this is kind of. I'm kind of – well, he didn't directly say this, but what he essentially seemed to say to me is, well, I'm putting this on the owners. you got to make a decision to move them out of the league, and I'll be disappointed if it's not unanimous. I mean that's essentially yeah. what he told them, and that's – and I think that's what's going to happen because even, you know, like you mentioned to Cuban earlier, he, he initially tweeted about this, and uh, it was sort of a – uh, he was like, well, you know, we should just be thinking about the playoffs or whatever. But by the end of this, he was like, this guy's right. I'm behind this guy. And it seems like everyone is going to fall in line now. Right. Because it, it must be a little – like I'm sure if you are an owner, um, it has to be a little bit uh, discomforting to know that your private conversations now, even if uh, they are taped illegally by the laws of your state, that, uh, that, that this is something that could feasibly happen. And it's certainly understandable. I mean, it's not like a, you know, it's not like all these franchises are these autonomous businesses. I mean, they're all under the same umbrella, but I wonder how, you know, uh, it, it, it is like, what, what, what do you like, would you have in the hypothetical I gave you earlier, like six yeah. months ago, what, what, what do you think you would have said if I'd asked you that then? Like if I would describe the scenario that actually happened, how would you have felt about it without kind of seeing it for real? I would have said the commissioner works for the owners. And I think you look at uh, some of the things they've done over these last over these last few years just in the NBA. That's certainly been the case there. You know, whether it's what they did with the lockout um, was was to create a better financial system for the owners. They didn't care that the fans were freaking out that they weren't going to have basketball. They were like, we're doing this. This is going to be better for us. We're going to make more money from doing this. Um, I, I just think that the situation is what it is. I think what the way Stern would have been different from Silver is I think he would have grandstanded a lot more and he would have been a lot more obstinate. Um, and he would have made the moment more about him and what I loved about what Adam did, Adam spent three days talking to basically everybody and getting opinions from all different people and was genuinely affected by it and was, you know, really wanted to do the right thing, not for him, but for the league. And because he knew it was an important moment, he's a huge basketball fan. And he's like, I want to get this right. And he talked to all kinds of people. And when he did it, his press conference was awesome. There was no grandstanding at all. He, his personality wasn't in that press conference. Yeah. He wasn't like milking the drama of it. He was just like, here's what I'm doing. I'm going to read this speech that we, that, you know, basically that tells me the verdict. I'm going to answer questions. Oh, uh, I'm going to spend one sentence answering each question. I'm not going to milk it. I'm not going to do dramatic pauses. I have all the answers ready. You fire stuff at me. I have your one sentence answer. I'm moving on to the next question. Like he was an assassin at that press conference. I was really impressed. Yeah. But I never very, felt like, was, I never felt like he's like, I'm owning this moment. This is great for me. He you know had I mean? a, he, in many ways, he had a very Vulcan delivery. Yeah. It was sort of like Leonard Nimoy was up there saying like, this is what's going to happen. Uh, he was awesome. Like, That's what I want from my commissioner. Yeah. I don't want him to feel like, I don't want to feel like it's an actor playing a commissioner. I just want somebody who's doing the right thing. Uh, you know, speaking about making it all about yourself or whatever, I got a question for you. How often yeah. does the Pro Basketball Hall of Fame, or I guess it's just the Basketball Hall of Fame, uh, induct referees? Oh. Because I was watching the game uh, this week, and I and uh, the the, the uh, Thunder game, and I thought to myself, you know what, Joey Crawford's going to be in the Basketball Hall of Fame because yeah. they, I feel like they do. 
occasionally induct referees. It's I only think Carl the Straub's ones, in there, right? Yeah, it's only the ones that are like most familiar to the average person. And like yeah. Joey Crawford is about as famous as you can be, him and Dick Pavetta, of being an NBA referee. So I'm watching that free throw, and I'm watching it. I, I don't know, I, did that cost them the game necessarily? It was just, it was a terrible decision. And while it I was. was watching it, I was thinking to myself, it's weird. There's like two Hall of Famers on the court right now, and they're involved in this. Durant yeah. and this referee whose career is basically categorized by being suspended and making terrible decisions. Yeah. I he uh that but he's I gonna make he, the hall of fame will he not make the hall of fame am i wrong in saying that there's there's every generation has one or two iconic referees and he's, and the, he's the one for this generation year, you know? yeah well jesus that this last round there mitch richmond getting in come on yeah <laughs> I, did you ever say in your life oh mitch richmond's coming to town like that at I, least should factor in a tiny bit to a hall of fame thing I feel like he just oh. spent his his whole career being someone that everyone was like, you know who's a little underrated? Mitch Richmond. Yeah. Until so many people said it, he became slightly overrated at the end. Yeah, there's like David West get in now. Like, I, <laughs> we're the line. <laughs> Wait, I have a really – because we got to go in 10 minutes. I have a really important question. I feel like uh, the internet, social media, just everything about how the world works now sped up everything about this story, sped up the reaction, put more pressure on the NBA than it ever would have normally and, and all that stuff. If this happened in 2007, this entire story, what happens? 2007. Well, the internet still exists in 2007. We have, we have um, the embryonic stages of sports blogs. We have no Twitter. We um, have Facebook, but not totally. I mean, not in the form we have. We have no podcasts. We had a 24 we have hour, not 24 nearly as many internet sites. Cycle. 24 hour news. We have 24 cycle. hour news cycles insight. We have yeah. sports radio shows. Um, I think that no Instagram. Well, I mean, the number of people who would have heard this clip would be much smaller. Um, it would, and the people who heard the clip would often have heard it on television, which means they would have heard. 12 seconds of it wouldn't have been the same wouldn't have been the same i mean if this happens in 1997 he doesn't lose his franchise if it happens in 2007 um boy i think that the fine is the same and that he's suspended for the rest of the playoffs and the hope would be from the nba front office that people essentially forget about this before the season starts again. That's what I would I agree. speculate. I would speculate. I agree. Oh, you know, also, okay, so what What does that mean then if something like this happens in 2024? If we assume well, that this acceleration is going to continue, will the entire well, events of this week happen in two days? <laughs> that's where I'm going. Because that's the one part that scares me a little about this is – the speed of which stuff happens now. And in this case, the speed was justified and worked and helped the process. There's going to be times when a situation is a lot more nuanced and black and white. And yet when everybody mobilizes behind the same opinion, I do worry what's going to happen if it's not a black and white situation like this one was. Um, The speed that the internet works now is frightening. Well, and just uh, – and, and that it has emboldened other things now. It's like, uh, you know, uh, in this situation, I guess I feel like the outrage was totally justified. But yes. the way uh, particularly – and I think in a way we're really specifically talking about Twitter with here. It's like it, that technology has sort of made uh, outrage – for any reason, much more acceptable. And uh, I, I, it becomes I, performance I, art. Yes. Yeah. And it's a uh, and and there's a real hunger for it. I mean, there's just this real hunger in the culture to have any bias you hold uh, validated by someone else. I mean, this is the thing that has pretty much destroyed TV news in America. And it's, it's also sort of, you know, um, kind of becoming involved with 
almost all discourse is this kind of this un previously unrealized desire um, to share your anger with people and to have that anger sort of cul-de-sac with an event. Um, you know, if it's not necessarily the removal, well, like with, with like Stephen Colbert or whatever, w- w- yeah. uh, the, not even necessarily the fact that Stephen Colbert, you know, loses his show or has to, uh, you know, uh, you know, publicly apologize. But just so that we all that this group of people can sort of have this collective sense that they had an impact on the culture, that their anger uh, wasn't just something that was just just sort of boiling inside their mind, but that it spilled out into the world and the world had to accept it. The world had to deal with their outrage. So if you speed that process up, it's pretty obvious that it's going to be detrimental. But people have been saying well, this my, for and also, 50 years. You know? My fear is that as just an American is we're heading toward – like this country was built on free speech, right? Um. Had somebody written this week, there was an obvious counter piece to be written about uh, this whole Sterling thing this week. And I don't know if anybody wrote it or not, if they did, and I missed it. I apologize. But playing off what Cuban said, you could have written a really smart piece arguing that um, what happened here was wrong because this was a privately taped conversation. It was released without his consent. And now he's having property taken away from him, which is basically the case that Cuba made yesterday. Somebody could have written a whole really thoughtful essay about this, and I feel like they would have been destroyed on the internet for well, it. Well, you know, Joyce Carol and it would have has- and it would have it would have been made people afraid to even think about a counter thing. And that's the part that scares me is like I think people should if you feel strong and you want to have a thoughtful opinion about something that goes against the grain, I really hope that people still write it and they aren't afraid about Oh, this is going to happen if I do this. And, and well, if, no, yeah, if that's the like, climate we have, that's scary to me. Joyce Carol Oates kind of expressed this idea. She basically said, like, boy, do you remember a time when you could have a private conversation and sense that that was the total parameters of the discourse that it wasn't going to spill out? And she did get hammered for that. I mean, like, uh, you know, it just. By the way, I wouldn't have agreed with that opinion, but he, like what we grew up reading. People made arguments about stuff like part of what writing a sports piece was or an essay or feature is you took a premise and you argued one side of it. But now yeah. it seems to the, the the culture that we're in now, it's like you can't argue one side of something because everyone's going to rip apart the other side of that story. Well, it's, not, what even, was really it's interesting, not even the ripping. It's the idea that they can actually mobilize to attack a piece like it'd be right. one thing there was always the sense that if somebody wrote a piece and it was sort of a bombastic um, sort of incendiary thing that the assumption was a large majority of the people consuming it will disagree with it or or, or at least a large minority they will read it and say like i just I, you know, I hate this guy or whatever but yeah. what has changed is the ability to actually put together an army of like-minded people and you know, sort of serve as a, as a kind of cultural police like to a, stop that from happening. A and, mob. And I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that, I mean, I'm certainly not the first person to say this or to think this, but, I mean, over time, you know, all technology is great in the short term and has problems in the long term. The long term effect of you know, the internet and our ability to communicate is going to be a chilling effect on people's ability to express ideas. You already see this in things like stand up comedy, where, yes. you know, where many comedians will say now that that there there's just there there's it's not worth going to a small club to try out risky new material because the downside is so great. If somebody has their phone uh, recording what you're saying and putting it on the air, it can end your career. So it's just not worth it. I mean, that's the thing. It's like you can still write whatever you want. People can mobilize against it, and you know you're still kind of you know protected by law. But any any reasonable person thinks to themselves, "Is this worth it? Like, is, is the downside to what will happen to sort of having a, a like a, a contrarian point of view? Well, you know that could that could you know destroy my li- livelihood and, and just be this you know this 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 thing that I can't get away from. So, is it worth it? You know. I was listening to Coward today. I actually went on Coward's show today, and Coward was talking about um, 
Durant. You know, he's playing up the Durant thing. It's a sports radio show. He's on for three hours. Durant, is he too passive aggressive? Is he missing something? You know, and I'm thinking, he, like, on the one hand, a really good sports radio argument, right? But on the other hand, I could pick that apart in two seconds and make all these points. So when I went on the show, I, I joked about it with them. And, but that's the kind of thing, like, in this day and age, I'm glad he brought that up. I don't agree with it. I can pick it apart. I have five different ways to say, actually, you're wrong. Like, you can't blame Durant for this. Like, he's playing with a point guard who's not actually a point guard. He's playing with a coach who doesn't run an offense. He's still at a young stage of his career. He's not the player he's going to be. I have all the counter arguments to it. Um, but I think what what seems to be happening more and more in 2014 is there's this element that's just like, go after Coward for saying that. You know, let's get, let's go. This guy hates Durant. Why do you hate Durant? Go after him. And meanwhile, there's like a good discussion in there. What does Durant have to do to get better? I guess. Right. I mean, like you clearly know, he's, he's a six eleven guy who's, who's being guarded by a six four guy and he can't post him up. Like he does ha- have to do things to make himself better. I feel like that kind of conversation yeah. that that's, I, it, it, I guess it makes it tougher on a guy like Colin Coward because he has to then think, well, that it's not going to be my opinion that's going to be debated. It's going to be sort of my value as a person or whatever. Uh, that that doesn't make me so nervous. I mean, what, what makes me more nervous are that, you know, like contrary opinions are sometimes really important. And you don't want them only being made by people who – um, are just too myopic to care about the reaction. You sort of want somebody who is yeah. maybe you know a, maybe a little understated and a little uh, you know and 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 not necessarily just trying to get a market share of the attention to be able to make those kind of arguments. And I, I feel like now the only people who sort of want to make the crazy arguments are the crazy people. Who don't care what happens, you know, when the, when when they put that out, and that's like that's really bad for discourse. That's a real terrible thing. Like, what if what if on Monday somebody on Grantland wrote a piece? The players were cowards in Game Four. This is a league that was built on all these people that took stands, and Bill Russell and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Bill Walton and Oscar Robertson and Elgin Bell, all these people who fought for where the league is going. And instead, we had these guys who had a chance to make a real stand and to stick up for the league and everyone who fought for those guys to get there and get the contracts they have. And all they did was throw their warm ups at midcourt and play the game. Now, that somebody pers- written that piece, I think he would have gotten killed. He would have gotten killed and you would have gotten killed. <laughs> there would have been people. We would have gotten killed would- for running it. Yes. So, I mean, that, it's like it would it actually put someone in your position uh, in this awkward sort of space where they are then uh, to a degree responsible for people who are trying to sort of forward opinions that aren't necessarily the status quo or the safest possible opinion. Now, I mean, it's it's weird in a way. There's a, like an easy like there's an easy counter to this argument. Like we're talking about how this, you know, I'm t- sort of arguing how there's going to be this kind of chilling effect. And then somebody could easily respond by saying, oh, so you're saying the Internet's making uh, fewer insane arguments when actually it does seem to be making more. Yeah. But the difference is this. They right. are taken far less seriously. They are just sort of seen as extensions of the writer trying to get clicks or trying to sort of, uh, you know, uh, to get attention. It's what is sort of being lost is the kind of person who wants to have opinions that aren't really in the mainstream and yet are still sort of like like thoughtful. And, you know, you don't you see what I'm saying or do you? Does it does it? Does it matter who would have had that opinion? Like, let's say let's say Wesley Morris. Let's say he came on, he called me on Sunday night and said, I hate what the players did. I want to write a piece that I think they were cowards. I hate to bring Wesley in this. I'm sorry, Mm. Wesley. You know, I love you. But let's say he did that. Let's say he's like, I have the right to write this piece for you. I've earned it. I've done great work for you over the last two years. I want a Pulitzer Prize. I feel really strongly about this. And I want to write a thoughtful piece about how disappointed I am in the players. And I think they, they were cowards yesterday in that game. Mm-hmm. Now, what's my responsibility as an editor? Um, well, I would think you would you would run that piece. 
I, I absolutely. I mean, I uh, particularly uh, in this in this hypothetical you're painting, like uh, the, the 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 validity of the source makes me, you know, it's you know there are there are writers out there who, if they wanted to write that piece, I would question what their actual motive was. Like, I, like you With know, uh, so for you to come down to yeah. the motives, I, I think so. So Wesley yeah. had. Wesley would have built up a track record for you of being a thoughtful human being who cared about the right things. And if he wrote that piece, then you would have read it and not judged it for anything other than. If I'm in your position, whoever wants to write that piece, I would say, write it. You know, and in all likelihood, I would want to write it regardless of who who produced it, assuming the piece was good. However, uh, I would definitely feel differently if, if a different person wrote it in some – I mean not and, – and I'm not talking really about anybody from Granlin. I'm just, there's writers in my mind though who I'm thinking of who if, if I heard that yes. you know, person X wrote that piece, my first thought would not be – You'd be worried. I would, oh, I would think that I know why they're doing this, I, that, that, that they're looking yeah, you for – you think they're you know, going for clicks. Yeah. Yes, and uh, uh, so – you know what's you know what's funny? In the last thirty minutes of this podcast, I can just tell you're delighted. This is like so all this conversation is in your wheelhouse. Well, <laughs> it's like, I this was an it's like watching somebody throw yeah. the right fastball to David Ortiz. It's like, it, oh, it, this is great. It was a real in, this was a real interesting, important problem, I think. I just I I, I, I agree. I would I would I, not I honestly I will, I'm not kidding. I'm not what? kidding when I say I really feel like this is one of the seven or eight most important weeks in the history of, of the NBA. It really was. And I, and uh, I, I think it's almost we're too close to it. And we're going to look back and think like, oh, my God. Remember that playoffs when, when the Clippers almost weren't good, when we almost had three games canceled on a Tuesday night because this owner was a crazy racist? I, well, I don't I- think it's set in yet. What are the other examples of American owners who have been essentially forced to sell their team? Do you th- – this will be my uh, last question. Any- and we're going to go. Man, it's, it's – it's, I mean, they couldn't even get George Shin to sell his team. And he, he – Charlotte hated him so much he had to move the team, and they couldn't get him to sell it. They gave up basketball in Charlotte because they couldn't figure out a way to take it away. Um, last question. After this whole thing, do we have to rethink – Using the word owner. Um, now you're basing this on the fact that if if a, if a league can take away a franchise uh, from a person, does that mean he's really just kind of leasing it or renting it in perpetuity, and he's not truly owning it? Is that, that what you mean? That one, and then two, the concept of somebody owning players. Oh, is that something okay. we need to get rid of? But what you said too, those two reasons. Um, well, I'm the owner. I own Chris Paul. Is that something that we want to keep going in 2014? Uh, but you own the franchise. I mean, if I, if I open a bakery, I own a bakery, but I don't feel like I would be ever arguing. I own my employees. I employ my employees. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's uh, ownership almost suggests uh, an inability for the employee to you know to quit or to leave. Now that's not so insane because you know what options does Chris Paul have if if he doesn't want to play for the Clippers? I mean, he can like play for the other league. Well, there really isn't an other league. He can play in Europe. He can you know, but uh, so in a sense. He doesn't really have the full options a normal employee has, but I mean, what would be a what would be a better term for the CEO. person? The C- CEO. Uh, we have um, Thirty CEOs of NBA teams. That's well, what it, that's what I think would be the alternative. And the other thing, Silver basically created this new world that, it, assuming this works out and Sterling doesn't figure out a way to sue it and ruin it, he's created a new world in which the 30 owners own stakes in the league. And it's almost like they it's like 30 people who own Dunkin' Donuts franchises. Mm-hmm. Right. And so he's saying now, if I don't like the way you run your Dunkin' Donuts franchise, I'm taking away that franchise and I'm selling it to somebody else and you can get the profit from mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. time that you put in with that franchise. Yeah. But that's not the way it was a week ago. 
a week ago it was these 30 guys own teams in the National Basketball Association, and they could do whatever they wanted. If they relocated the franchise, they had to get approval and pay a fee. If they sold the team, the other owners had to approve who that owner was. But other than that, they got to pretty much do what they want. Hmm. And now we have, we are saying, no, actually, this this is a new world, and there are real uh, philosophical ramifications. That's the wrong phrase. There, yeah. there, there are ramifications yeah. to things that there, you yeah. say and do that did not exist a week ago. There are tangible ramifications. Yeah, tangible those. ramifications. There you go. You know, I'm a little groggy like, after seven minutes. I'll, just, I'll say this and then I'll, I'll, I'll get off. Uh, you know, you said this thing 90 seconds ago about retiring the term owner or whatever, and I was just kind of thinking about that over the last 90 seconds. I guess, you know, in a way now that I've considered a little bit um, – I really hate the idea of that because to me that is an example of where someone just thinks that by changing language they can change reality, mm. and that if we somehow, if we, if we all collectively agree that we should not use the word owner to designate the owner, that somehow uh, that changes what the actual dynamic is. I mean, the fact of the matter is that the definition of that word fits. What, the, what 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 someone like Donald Sterling or Mark Cuban or any of these guys are. So I guess I would be uh, against the idea of removing the word owner from the lexicon as a way to make the average person feel a little better about what they're actually seeing. Well, here's the, here's the irony of that word. We use it wrong 90% of the time. Like Joe Lacob isn't the owner of the words. He's the majority owner. But we never say owner. We just say, that's Joe Lacob. He owns the Warriors. But the reason we, that, we, that, that leagues demand – the leagues demand a majority owner, right? Right, right. But we should yeah. call these people ma the majority owner. Or in Sterling's case, he's the owner because I don't think anybody else even owned a percentage of that team. But that yeah, rarely but, happens. Everybody yeah. owns a majority stake of a team, and they're the majority owner. If you're a majority owner, though, you're the de facto owner. You're the that, CEO. If, if, if every other shareholder disagrees with you, it does not matter. You possess right. fifty-one percent of the votes, so so you are the owner. I mean, it's like a uh, no. I, but you just described you're the CEO. Well, you just described you're the CEO. But what, what I'm saying, de facto, though, if that is the case, if you are, you know, you can label that person the CEO. But if ultimately every decision that involves any kind of vote or a need for consensus will immediately fall into the lap of the majority owner, he is the owner in totality. I mean, it, if, if yes. any time, you know, so like in the the this is a little semantic, but I mean, if the, the, the working definition of a majority owner is owner, if, if every decision ultimately is theirs, that if they want to allow input from from the minority owners, a, a, you know, the minority shareholders, I mean, that's sort of their discretion. They can totally ignore it if they want. I liked how you answered that. This was fun. Chuck Klosterman, a pleasure as always. You knew we'd have to do this at some point this week. Uh, hopefully we'll see you uh, back on the BS Report and on Grantland.com soon. Hope all is well. It, Hope man. all is well with the new baby. Oh, yep. Yeah, it's going well. It's going well. All right. All right, good. We'll talk to you soon. Target the sun off. Whoa. Thank you for downloading the BS Report with Bill Simmons. Too much. Bye. Check out more podcasts at the iTunes Music Store or at PodCenter at ESPNRadio.com. Peace out. Got to say, Gola, great call on grabbing Subway for lunch and getting guacamole on our subs. Told you this new guac really amps up the flavor. Yep, something adding up. Things can be great. Guacamole on your sub, a new co-host to replace you. What was that? Oh, no, nothing. Subway now has deliciously rich new guacamole made from ripe Haas avocados with just a hint of garlic, onion, and jalapeno. Discover how new guacamole turns up the flavor on any of your freshly made favorites. Subway. Eat fresh.